Hello everyone, I'm here uh, with Mark Russell Smith, our music director, and uh, we're thrilled to be uh, talking to you all today a little bit about our next Masterworks concert, uh, which has a theme, Conflict. How did that theme come about and uh, wh what's the sort of spirit of this program? Well, uh, there are many, many factors involved. Right. Uh, one of them is the time of year, and so you try to be maybe topical if there's uh, some kind of extra musical event, and, and that event in this case is Veterans Day. Right. Um, it's the hundredth anniversary of Veterans Day, of the naming of Veterans Day, which was exactly one year after World War One ended. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's the hundred and first anniversary of the end of World War One, and so to commemorate that and to make works of conflict the focus um, was the idea, and that was the genesis of that. The Shostakovich Leningrad Symphony just has such a fantastic story, and and. It really is one, one of the great 20th century masterpieces, musically speaking, but also its place in history and the story around it is just incredibly rich and, and I think fantastic. Maybe, uh, and of course he wrote it during World War II, maybe set the stage. Um, what was it like for Shostakovich as a Soviet composer? Any Soviet artist, it, it was incredibly complicated right. because Stalin, you know, along with Hitler, was among the most evil people who have ever lived. Right. I mean, Stalin right. killed millions of people as well. Um, but Stalin was no dummy, and he understood the power that the arts had. And especially he understood the power that music had. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had his, his hand in every composer's life and in every composer's output, and he really kept track of what was going on musically because he understood that that someone who's as gifted as Shostakovich and someone who's as gifted with musical psychology as Shostakovich could say all sorts of things that Stalin wouldn't approve of. Basically, composers lived in fear, literally in fear of their lives. Right. Um, Shostakovich was the boy wonder, and then he fell out of favor because he happened to choose a, a topic for an opera that, right. that right. Stalin didn't like. And so he went from being the superstar young wunderkind to to nobody, to the enemy of the people. And so he kind of resurrected his, his reputation through the Fifth Symphony, actually, and, and, and through kind of going along with you know, the composer's union and kind of doing all the right things that he needed to do politically. How he really felt deep down, I would say it's anybody's guess. I think it's, it's clear in his music quite often. But to survive, and for his family to survive, he had to play the game. At the time of the Seventh Symphony, this is when Hitler broke the pact that he had with Stalin, and so invaded the Soviet Union, and Leningrad, which was Shostakovich's hometown, was geographically situated in such a way that, that it was easily blockaded. Right. Hitler's strategy with the city that he despised, which was Leningrad, was to starve it to death. Right. Basically cut off food, cut off supplies, cut off medicine, just basically bring the population to its knees. So in the midst of this, this is again Shostakovich's hometown, in the midst of this, Shostakovich was led to write this symphony in honor of the citizens of Leningrad, in, in honor of the history, to, to really represent Leningrad. What, what they lived through was unimaginable. Some of the, uh, a horrible, horrible winter in 1941, starvation, um, you know, bo constant bombardment. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Shostakovich, he was writing and creating, living through the bombings and living through having, you know, writing one page of music and then having to go to a bomb shelter. And he was yep. creating this work while it was happening. What, he's not looking back. It's not referential. It is like, it is happening at the time. And so that gave it some power, I think. Um, the idea of unified Leningrad citizenry opposing fascism was, was very potent. And therefore, that took on a whole kind of extra Soviet meaning for us in the West, mm -hmm. for England and for America. This symphony now, which was kind of the artistic symbol of fighting fascism and ultimately triumphing. Um, and so the idea, this was very ripe, of course, for Western, for Western um, orchestras. And so the Soviet artistic authorities wanted to make sure that this was premiered in the Soviet Union in Moscow 
because at that time the Leningrad Orchestra was wiped out, basically. Mm -hmm. And right, so right. the premiere took place in Moscow. But now there were all sorts of Western uh, organizations, the NBC Symphony, Serge Kusevitsky and the Boston Symphony, Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic, um, the orchestras in, in, in England as well that wanted to play this piece because we are all now allied against fascism. So it's a very interesting story actually how the score was kind of smuggled out I think in microfilm, microfilm. and it was like it was put it's a Iran I think to right. Egypt to Brazil to an embassy in you know it's just right like it's a crazy, crazy yeah exactly like a sleuth like you know this microfilm of the symphony t to get out in the west because the Soviet authorities wanted to keep it for themselves yeah and it's interesting too like a couple points like um, so Shostakovich goes from being essentially denounced by Stalin to becoming this symbol that he can wield as propaganda right. with his own citizenry. But um, you know, I, I remember reading that there were uh, they were publicizing pictures of him as like a fire marshal right. up on the you know. Well, his job during the war was to look out for fires on top of the conservatory, right. the Leningrad right. Conservatory. Exactly. And so there's a famous picture that was on the cover of Time magazine, right. actually right around the time of, of the American premiere of the symphony, right. as this cultural hero, this guy, you know, this like really super nerdy guy, you know, being... Looks like you know, Harry Potter. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> like in a fireman's hat, you know. Yeah. I, this was on the cover of Time yeah. magazine. And so he was, he was presented as, you know, the iconic... Soviet artist and the Soviet artist and the Soviet people fighting fascism. Yeah, and um, so then the premieres happened, and I, I can't remember the exact order. I, I know London and New York happened, and I can't recall right. if Moscow was before. They were all kind Mo of right Moscow around, was first. Was first, right, and right, then it was right. London and New York, and that's right. when it became this international exactly. symbol, essentially right. of resistance. Right. But I think the most uh, amazing story of one of its premieres is in the city of Leningrad right. during right. the siege. Right. The cultural authorities uh, in the Soviet Union decided that we that there needed to be a performance in Leningrad. Of course, it's the Leningrad Symphony, and this is the one place where it hadn't been played. But there were a lot of reasons for that, and the biggest one is the, basically the what used to be a you know full orchestra of eighty five to one hundred people was decimated through death and through starvation and through disease to uh, literally, I think, 13 to 15 yeah, people. Like I mean, just a, just a small handful of musicians. There was a, actually a famous conductor there, and he was charged in basically put on a performance of this. And he gets the score and finds out it's you know, written for an orchestra of 100 people with extra trombones and extra trumpets and you know, eight percussionists. Right. And it's, it's, I like mean, mammoth how orchestra. How could you do that right. under those right. circumstances? Right, exactly. And somehow, I mean, through the force of will of this conductor and, th and through the connections of the Soviet authorities, an orchestra was assembled. And for the first time since the siege happened, like years or maybe a full year before, um, there was a concert, and, and the concert in the main concert hall. And for the citizens of Leningrad, uh, the symbolism there and the fact that, that you know, Come hell or high water, whatever is happening, whatever those Nazis are doing, we're going to have our culture. We're going to have an orchestra concert, and the, and the the incredible resonance that that mm -hmm. had with with the public just was it's hard to measure. You know? Yeah, and so it's it's an amazing story. Yeah, and they uh, not only was it in the concert hall, but they actually broadcast it over loudspeakers right throughout the city. Correct. And preceding the concert. Um, the Russians bombed or shelled the Nazi front to try to right. keep them quiet right. during the performance. During the performance. And they project and they, they broadcast it right. over right. over the, right. the enemy lines too, right. which is right. kind of insane to right. think about. Right, like, right, right. I mean so the Germans supposedly the Germans so so the lore goes, the Germans talked afterwards when they after they had lost the war saying, Well when we heard that, when we heard that you're still having concerts despite all this bombardment that's like we knew that we couldn't defeat you. We we knew we couldn't defeat the spirit. I you know, who knows if that's right. you know, if, if if a German soldier really said that, who knows? But yeah. but but that but the symbolism is just incredibly rich. We hope to see you all on November 2nd and or November 3rd uh, at the other theater or Centennial Hall. It's going to be a great show. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all there.